I was born June 24, 1905. Mm -hmm. It was the Feast of St. John mm -hmm. on my father's name day. Mm -hmm. In the old country, they do not celebrate birthdays. They celebrate name day. Mm -hmm. And that was my father's name day. And as far as it was a great day at my, my parents' home. My, fa my parents, I think they were comfortable people. They lived in... Uh, Mesopotamia in a city called Merdin, mm -hmm. which is Turkey. Okay, can you like tell me how how is the city set up? I mean, the city is a very ancient city. It's built on the top of a mountain, mm -hmm. and it stands ten thousand feet above sea level. Oh, gosh. And it has narrow streets. And the only streets where you can put a, a car can pass through, that was below our house. Mm -hmm. And when you come from this, from the uh, the train, the station, to go to the to the government, to the uh, governmental officer. To government officer, there was only one road, one wide road to the city. What? What business was your father in? Before My you? father was a furrier. He had his own a business. Furrier. Yeah. Okay. Was he? Was it a family-owned business? His own. It oh, was his, his own, own business. Okay. Yeah. And the the section where you lived was it? Okay, I know that um, at that time, hey, there was there were Muslim sections and Christian sections, and they were separate in the city. Well, the um, the section we lived in, it was more or less in the center of the city, and there was nine stores under our house. And there was the only dentist in the city, it was on our property. Mm -hmm. The only doctor beside the, the, uh, beside the uh, American mission, mm -hmm. it lived on our property. The only drugstore in that city was on our property, believe it or not. Okay. And uh, there was three or four stores that were weavers. My uncles, my father, brothers were weavers. They used to weave material. And uh, they also had people working for them. Mm -hmm. But my father, he was a furrier. So, so then came order from the government, from the Turkish government that all people of Armenian descent must be thrown out of the country. And then what did you do? Then we were massacred. Well, how how do you remember that actually happened? Do you remember them taking people away? Um, well, first thing they did was, I used to stand, I had a habit, I used to stand by the courtyard, but our house being the on the main street of the, I used to always gaze, stand at the, by the courtyard and see who's coming and going because, I said to um, I said to my mother one day, I said, Ma, I see some people coming on horses and they look very strange to me. And they were they had a lot of a lot of pin, uh, medals? medals on them. And I said, uh, I've never seen those kind of medals before. She says to me, You always bring me some kind of a new stuff. She said, Don't don't come back with these. Two, three days after, the following day, we saw the bishop going by and the priest. They were taken to, to jail. And we tried to find out why. You are Armenians. There is an order from the national government. You go to jail. 
So they took all the people that are well known. When people of authority, people of business, mm -hmm. they took all the men first, mm -hmm. put them in jail without any reason at all. Mm -hmm. After that, kept them in there for about a week, tie them, they're back. Took them outside the city and killed them. So when that was going on, like um, your mother was widowed and she had all your children, what? How did you decide to leave? When we couldn't leave. leave. We couldn't okay. leave. We were massacred. Well, how did and then they out? had to. They they give. Then they come with order. So they come with an order from the government. You have an hour to, t to leave this house. Police will knock on your door and say, you got an hour to leave this house. And all you can take is what you can carry food enough for overnight or for two days. So my mother swallowed 10 $5 goals. Swallowed them? Swallowed them. 10 $5 goals. And what she was able to pick up, a little bit of bread and a little bit of this. Mm -hmm. And they gave us a couple of donkeys mm -hmm. to ride on. Mm -hmm. And without any, uh, without any uh, saddle. And where so did you go? we, that night, that was, uh, that was August 15, 1915. And I'll never forget it, Sunday. So, and then we were guarded. We had guards all around us. They took us outside the city. And around, all around the city, it was all orchards, farms. So we were, we were put, we were put, left there outside that city that night, and we had guards all around us. And. Uh, we had to sleep on the ground. The next morning, as soon as the sun was up, we had to get up. Put the kids on the donkeys, and the, the natives, they, had, they, they brought their donkeys, and the, each family was assigned two donkeys. So what they do, whatever they were given, mm -hmm. they put their, and the, the adults had to walk. And there were no young men was left. Because they were all killed? They were all killed. Only all men and and women and children, that's all. So that day, all day, we were riding, my brother and I were riding the donkeys. My mother was walking. My uncle, my grandfather Gregory, that's my mother's father, mm -hmm. he was riding without a saddle and he was a small man, my grandfather. So we arrived at a place with a little stream. And he, it was hot, the, oh, that country is hot in the summertime, and the sun would hit you. So he sat down and she says to him, Dad, you better get up. Here comes a soldier. He says to her daughter, I'm very tired. So she held him by the arm and she said, get up, let's cross this stream. Mm -hmm. So comes a soldier, he grabs her and he throws my mother across the stream. You big Armenian, he says, and he turns around and shoots my grandfather. Right in front of, right in front of all of us. And we had to keep going. You couldn't bury him? No, we couldn't. And he had to her, daughter, daughter. What could we say? Mm -hmm. And he turned around, he said to my mother, you stay here and I'll put you on top of it. Wow. And you know how hard that is? It must have been awful. It's, it's terrible. We arrived at the village that evening and two of my aunts, three, one my mother's sister and two of my father's uh, wives, a uh, brother's wives, right. had babies. But those babies cried so much, and it was so hot, 
and the son, those babies died. By the time we, the sun down, we had, imagine you walk in the hot sun from the sunrise to sunset. Mm-hmm. So we arrived at the town near, near stream water. So we washed ourselves and we gathered a little bit. They gathered, there was a little bit of food. Mm-hmm. We ate. Kids, the kids don't know any better. They we slept mm-hmm. on the ground. Mm-hmm. Then those babies died. They wrapped them up in a blanket. Mm-hmm. And my mother and my aunt Mary went to the natives of that village, and they says to them, "Could you please dig us a place so we could bury those babies?" Mm-hmm. And nobody cried for the babies. None of the natives did. No, I mean us. We were, were too we, we were too overcome, and we were glad that they that they were they were relieved yeah. because they cried all day. They were, it was such a visit, you know. It was such a time that when somebody dies, you say, "Well, at least their trouble is over." Yeah. So, and she said to my mother, one lady, one native lady, says to her, "What's your name?" She said, "Well, I am Sophie Kespo." Oh, she said, the Caspo family owns this town. When are they going to come to to collect their... Uh, crops? The crops. So my mother says to her, you can have it all. She said, all the Caspos are dead. Well, she says to her, you are a Caspo. I see you're not dead. She said, we are the poor Caspo. Now, you see, the times that the times comes that you couldn't even say that you are. Mm-hmm. She said, the rich Caspos are all dead. We are the poor Caspos, so they didn't kill us. Yeah. They sent them us out. So they buried the babies. And then that night, my mother's oldest brother was with us. So we found one soldier, my uncle's, and grandfather used to trade with him, used to buy vegetables from him. And when he found them, he was a soldier. They had taken him to the army. And, and he, he felt very bad, and my mother told him about my grandfather. He said, had I known, I would have never allowed it to happen. So he says to my mother, he said, Sophie, I want you to know one thing. Gabriel will never I will see to it that nothing will ever happen to him. He rented something for us to put two kids on this side, on the donkey, and two kids on the other side. And my being the oldest child, they put they had me riding the donkey in the middle. And, uh, and then he assigned the soldier to take us ahead of the crowd so we wouldn't crash with the others. And he assigned another soldier to be with my uncle Gabriel, so nobody will attack him. Mm-hmm. And we arrived at a town, it's called Ras Ain. That means the head of a stream mm-hmm. in English. In Arabic, it's called Ras Ain. Mm-hmm. And we were left up there for about seven, eight days. And whenever my mother finds, goes to the toilet, or go, goes, she digs out and finds something, and some money comes out, she mm-hmm. buys from the natives and mm-hmm. try to mm-hmm. keep us alive. Right. So one of my father's youngest brother had escaped from the army, and he was with the natives in the desert. And when they found out that we were massacred, we could not supply them with no more food and no more money, they threw my uncle out. So my uncle came to stay with with us, with his sisters and us, Mm -hmm. in the the desert, in in the fields. And we were all guarded. So one day, we were 
my Aunt Mary again and my mother, they went out picking up twigs from the ground. They were going to cook something for us for supper. She found two men. She saw two men coming from far away on horses. She said, oh, dear God, she said, it's not impossible that those two men will come and say, I come to take you to safety. I came from you, brothers. And my Aunt Mary says to her, Sophie, you are dreaming. She said, nothing is impossible with God. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, it was. Believe it or not. It was your, your uncle? My Uncle John and my Uncle Alexander were with the German, mm -hmm. with the German chief engineer mm -hmm. from 1912. And they were, my Uncle John was a chef. And my Uncle Alexander was interpreter. My Uncle John, he used to be Jesuit student. He was a, in a Jesuit order for six years. Mm -hmm. And then he, my grandfather didn't want him to be a Jesuit. He had left home without, yes. his, without his father's blessing. So uh, the head of the school says to him, John, he said, uh, he said, I don't see you get any mail job. Uh, he said, well, my mother knew I was going to, I want to be, a, 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 I want to go into a religious order, but my father didn't want me to. So the head of the seminary says to him, look, John, you need your father's blessing. You better go back home and get your parents' blessing and then doors will always be open for you. Mm -hmm. So my Uncle John came back home. You see how things turn out. When he arrived home, my grandfather convinced him that you don't have to be a priest mm -hmm. to be a good man. You mm -hmm. can be married and raise a family and still be a good man. Mm -hmm. So, he accepted my father, my grandfather's uh, decision, and he got married. And he took, he got this job with Herr Fenner, the chief engineer, and he took my uncle Alexander had graduated that year too, and he took him with them, and they went to Aleppo, mm -hmm. and they were traveling all the time between Aleppo and Mirdin, mm -hmm. and they were, he was, they were laying the the. Uh, the tracks between uh, Aleppo and, you know, and from between railroad Syria, tracks. the railroad tracks, uh, Syria and Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. Their boss was the chief engineer. Okay. Yeah. Well, he had been to the house good many times, and therefore he knew the family. And one when I, my uncles were in Aleppo and they heard about the massacre in Mesopotamia, they told him about it. So what he did, he wrote to the national government in, in, uh, in Istanbul, and he requested to have the Kespo family be no longer Turkish subject, to be German protective. Mm -hmm. And when the time, when that order came, we were already driven out of our house, and we were in the desert. Right. And all this had happened to us. Right. So when those two men arrived in the desert, we were already there. And when they arrived and, my, and they saw my mother, and uh, my mother went to them and she says to him, you looking for somebody? He said, yes, we are looking for John uh, and Alexander's uh, family, mm -hmm. Kespo family. She said, I am a Kespo. I'm, I'm Sophie Kespo. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, well, I got to go to the selectman and I got to get a request for your release. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take you to safety, you and your family. Mm -hmm. And what a beautiful day that was. Mm -hmm. We were 27 people taken out of thousands of people from that camp. Because that was the whole family, you know, 27 of you or just a bunch of you? A 27 of that uh, Kespo family. family. Mm -hmm. We were taken out to safety 
-hmm. We were put in a, we were taken to a place called Talabyev, uh, White Hills, mm -hmm. and that was occupied by the German. So it was safe. Yeah, uh, we were given, we were given hot water to take baths, we were given food to eat, and then we were put on a train and we were sent to Aleppo, Syria. And that's how you got to Aleppo. And that's how we arrived in Aleppo. Gözlerin lanetsiz siyah 